Okay, so let's uh, get started again. Uh, so now we are uh, beginning part two of this, uh, I don't know, this little retreat or whatever you want to call it. Uh, um, and uh, this is the second part. This is the last part. There is no part three here. Actually, the part three is when you all go back home and you have to kind of con continue on. That's part three. Uh, and uh, part three is actually the most important part. Yeah. <laughs> how you deal with these things later on. Uh, but uh, for now, we're going to focus on part two, and we'll, maybe we can say a bit more about part three as we uh, uh, towards the end of this whole thing here. So um, part two is going to be about uh, uh, finding joy uh, in the practice. Uh, and uh, one of the kind of main teachings on finding joy in the practice is what is called the six recollections. Uh, these are the six anusatis, uh, and we're going to look at this hopefully in quite a bit of detail. Uh, but one of the, just to start off, one of the kind of great things about the Buddhist path, uh, uh, when you look at it, when you understand it properly, uh, is that it, in the end it is all about happiness. Uh, that's kind of the purpose of the Buddhist path. Uh, and sometimes I think we miss this in Buddhism. Uh, we misunderstand what these teachings are about. Uh, and especially when you hear about dukkha all the time, you may think it is all about dukkha. But uh, if it is all about dukkha, it's kind of pointless, uh, yeah, because uh, uh, dukkha in its own right is not really all that useful. It is when we overcome that dukkha, that's kind of the whole point of the Buddhist practice. And part of the overcoming of the dukkha uh, is to find happiness, yeah, find joy, find gladness on the path, uh, all of these positive qualities. Uh, that's a very important part of that. Uh, and I think we should, as Buddhists, we should focus more on the happy aspects of Buddhism and maybe not quite so much on dukkha. And the reason is simply that most people, they can relate to happiness. But if you talk too much about dukkha, they don't really understand what you mean by that because it's actually very profound. Yeah? It may sound like a simple thing, the idea of dukkha or suffering, but actually it's very profound. Whereas joy is more easy to understand. And that is why I think it's useful to focus on this. So, and uh, when you start reading the suttas and you understand the path properly, uh, uh, the way the Buddha talks about it, uh, every stage uh, on the path uh, has a degree of happiness that comes with it. Uh, yeah? You abandon something, and that abandonment of something, starting with abandoning bad conduct, uh, all of these things have <clears throat> a, an aspect of joy that arises with it. Uh, and this is kind of one of the main purposes of the Buddhist path. Uh, and of course, the joy that you find in meditation, that you find on the spiritual path, is a very different kind of joy that you find in ordinary life. Uh, and in fact, that is far more interesting kind of joy. Uh, the joys in ordinary life are very uncertain. Uh, they're not very profound. They're often on the surface. Uh, they often deal with the external world. They don't deal with the mind. And of course, sometimes you realize that even though the external world may be all coming together nicely, if your mind is not in the right place, it kind of doesn't matter all that much. Yeah, you see people around the world who are very wealthy or who are very famous, and everything in the external world seems to be okay. And still they're miserable. Still they jump off tall buildings when the stock market goes you know, wrong. Still they do all these kind of crazy things. Why? Because their mind is not right so if you want to be happy, the obvious solution is to deal with the mind. Yeah? And if you can change the mind, and you can make the mind better, and you can find happiness there, then, then you're solving everything right there in one go. And then suddenly the external world doesn't matter so much anymore. It doesn't matter so much if uh, the external world comes together or not, because you have an inner refuge, an inner sanctuary, an inner place that makes you resilient and strong, and you can deal with all the shocks on the outside. So it makes sense to go straight to the source, and this is what the Buddhist path really is about. And uh, what is surprising is actually how much happiness is actually available on that path. Um, the degrees yeah, of joy that can be experienced in meditation practice, for example, is just astonishing. Yeah? And most people have no idea of what is available. And if they really understood what was available, they would be practicing Buddhism all the time. They would become kind of really, uh, they would just, all they would do would be practice the Buddhist path. They would never forget uh, for a moment uh, what is right to do and what is wrong to do. Uh, and they would always do what is right. Uh, 
is because we don't understand the potential of this path. We don't understand what is possible to achieve. That is why our commitment and perseverance isn't that great. So it is about understanding the potential is actually so, matters enormously. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I think everyone really would be Buddhist if they fully understood what actually is going on on this path. Uh, so I want to discuss more about this uh, joy in the practice uh, and uh, the uh, joy on the Buddhist path. It uh, very often it starts out with simple things. Uh, of course, it starts out with things like you know being living well and being generous and all these kind of things. I will discuss this later on. Uh, uh, but in as far as meditation is concerned, uh, it starts out with uh, you know making yourself peaceful and calm, and from that initial peace and calm, the initial kind of letting go. Yeah, it happens maybe through mindfulness or breathing or just relaxing in meditation. Through that, uh, very often, that's the beginning point uh, to make joy rise in the practice. Uh, and so for that reason, I'm going to start out, as I often do, to talk a little bit again about the Anapanasati Sutta, the discourse of mindfulness of breathing, to discuss how joy comes out of that practice. Uh, so we'll start there. It's very, I do, I like to... Uh, discussed this sutta, and we discussed it many times before, but I think it's always nice to do it uh, one more time. And so let's uh, see what it has to say. So, um, Anapanasati Sutta, Mindfulness of Breathing. Yeah. And the most important version of this sutta, it occurs many places in the suttas. Uh, the most important version is found in the Majjhimanikai, the middle-length sayings of the Buddha, Number 118, mindfulness of breathing. Ana, ana means in breath. Ana, out breath. I think, I think that's the case. Either that or it's the other way around. Uh, it's very hard to know sometimes. Uh, sati, mindfulness. Uh, sutta, discourse. Uh, the discourse on the mindfulness of the in and out breath is quite literally what it means. Uh, so uh, we're going to have a look at this. And again, the, the sutta occurs in many, many places uh, in the suttas. Uh, the same 16-fold uh, sequence uh, of the mindfulness of breathing and anything that occurs in many places uh, that is taught many times by the Buddha, you can take it that it is an important discourse. Uh, and so this is a, an important one because it occurs so often. So it is one of the foundational things on the Buddhist path. Uh, and that makes it especially interesting, I reckon now. So uh, let's have a look, see what it says. So I have heard. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Sabati in the eastern monastery, uh, the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother, together with several well-known senior disciples. So, yeah, so uh, this is again staying near Sabati. Uh, and in the Eastern Monastery, the Eastern Monastery is the Pub Arama. Arama is monastery or park. Pub Pubba is east. It means like the first. Yeah, the first, because the sun rises in the east, so it's always the first, the first direction. Uh, the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother. Uh, Megara's mother, Megara Mata, that's also Visaka, yeah, Lady Visaka, the uh, well-known lay disciple of the Buddha. Uh, and she, one of the things she was famous for is she gave this, uh, uh, what is here called a stilt longhouse, the Pali word is a pasada. She gave that to the Sangha, uh, or, you know, of the Buddha, basically, as a residence. And this became known as the Eastern Monastery. So in uh, around Sabati, there were two fairly well-known large monasteries. One was the Anandapindika's monastery, also known as the Jetavana. And then you have the other one is the Eastern Monastery. Uh, and uh, sometimes the Buddha would stay in the Eastern Monastery instead. Uh, how does the Buddha choose which place to stay? Uh, don't know. <laughs> sometimes it stays there, sometimes it stays there. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how, how that works out. Uh, uh, and uh, so, and there's a very nice story of Megara's mother, Visaka, which you can read about. Uh, um, I don't, maybe don't won't go into that too much now, but she would, basically she was called Megara's mother, even though Megara was his, was her father-in-law. She was her mother, his mother, because uh, she brought him to the Dhamma. So she was his mother in the Dhamma. That's why she had this appellation, Megara Mata. 
uh, stilt longhouse, Pasada. These are stilt houses. Uh, and uh, in ancient India, good buildings were built on stilts uh, because of the monsoon season and all of these kind of things. Uh, and also, I think, for safety reasons, yeah, difficult for thieves and robbers to get into the house uh, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so uh, a stilt house is the proper translation there. And uh, so, uh, hmm. and uh, together with several well-known senior disciples. Uh, and uh, so who are these well-known senior disciples? Uh, do you have any idea who they are? Don't look at the page. Yeah. <laughs> Too easy. <laughs> okay, so it is Venerable Sariputta, right? I mean, you, you know these people, these, Ven these monks already. Uh, Venerable Mahamogalana, Venerable Mahakasapa, yeah? Venerable Mahakachana, we talked about him already at the beginning of the retreat. Uh, he's the one who gave the detailed exposition of the brief one. Uh, Mahakotita is one of these other very analytical monks. Uh, Venerable Mahakapina, Venerable Mahachunda. So when you, when you had the two other monks uh, just before I came, that was Chula Chunda, the lesser Chunda, this is the Maha Chunda. <laughs> so Malaysia, Malaysia Chunda, and uh, actually Malaysia, Malaysia, Australia Chunda. And then uh, Anur, Anuruddha, yeah, we have met Anuruddha before. Uh, Revata is another one of the um, famous monks, and Ananda and others. Uh, so these are the disciples. You see there's a missing, the nuns, no nuns are mentioned here. So that's uh, why is that? Is that because there weren't any senior disciples that were nuns? Yes, there were senior disciples that were nuns. Uh, but uh, the suttas, usually the Buddha would hang around with monks. He wouldn't hang around so much with nuns, yeah, because there was that division in the Sangha between the nuns and the monks. Uh, and so usually you would see the monks are mentioned. Uh, the nuns may have been around as well, uh, but uh, especially when it comes to talks and that sort of thing, because there was a regular... There was a lot of connection between the monks and the nuns. You had the Ovada, for example, the fortnightly instructions and these kind of things. So there was a connection there. But usually the monks are talked about because they were around and the Buddha would have expressed the teachings mostly to them. So uh, uh, it's important to see these things in the right way. What is interesting about this, you see this mentioning of all the senior disciples at the beginning of the sutta. And this is one of the criteria by which you can um, take it that this was an important sutta. Yeah? Why are all these senior disciples mentioned at the beginning? Well, obviously, this is an important occasion, right? Uh, this is kind of what this tells us. So, so uh, there's many ways of deciding whether something is an important sutta. Uh, one of them is that the sutta occurs very often. Uh, yeah, the Buddha talks about it again and again. Uh, it occurs in certain contexts, like the Bodhipakya Dhammas, the 37 uh, aids to awakening. Yeah, these are the core teachings of the Buddha. It occurs like this when there's many important people around. Yeah, this kind of tells you something about the occasion. So these are some of the criteria by which you know something is important. Uh, and so there's many reasons to think that uh, Satipata um, Anapanasati is important in this way. Yeah. And you can argue that in some ways uh, the uh, uh, Anapanasati is more important than the Satipatthana Sutta, for example. Satipatthana Sutta really only occurs once. Yeah, it actually occurs twice, but uh, that, that seems to be a duplication. So it only really occurs once. Uh, so although Satipatthana as such is important, uh, the Satipatthana Sutta is only one instance of Satipatthana. And uh, whereas the uh, mindfulness of breathing occurs all over the place. Uh, Anyway, that uh, doesn't really matter. I think it's always dangerous to say one thing is more important than others. They all kind of come together nicely usually. Yeah. So this is the background. And uh, then the Buddha says, Mendicants, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, uh, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Uh, we have this idea of developed and cultivated again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Aveti, Bhavana, and Bahulikata, I think are the words. It is very fruitful and beneficial. And remember, when the Buddha says something is very fruitful and beneficial, it means very fruitful and beneficial, like very with a capital V and fruitful with a capital F. This is what he means. So it means like it takes you all the way to the end of the path. Yeah. And this to me is one of those kind of remarkable things. Yeah, we are dealing with mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. 
Uh, it's a very simple idea. There's two things involved with mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness and the breath. That's always, that's really involved in that. Uh, and these are very natural phenomena. Yeah, they're very kind of down to earth. Uh, and this very natural down to earth uh, phenomena, phenomenon, this is all we have to, all we need uh, to be able to take it all the way to the very end of the path. Uh, and I think this is one of those uh, beautiful things about the most the earliest expression of the Buddhist teachings that we find in the Pali Suttas and also sometimes in the Agamas, uh, that it is very grounded. Uh, it is not kind of highfalutin. It's not kind of all kind of imaginations and weird stuff. Uh, it tends to be grounded. Uh, and uh, this is kind of what I like about the Dhamma, not too much uh, uh, super normal stuff and weird stuff that you, you know, maybe, maybe not, and you wonder whether it's really true or not. Are the stories exaggerated or are they, you know, you just don't know sometimes. You hear all of these things. Uh, and some of these things may be true because the mind is remarkably powerful, and yet other things you wonder about. Uh, and so I prefer the grounded things, things I can really relate to directly. Be kind. Okay, that makes sense. Be compassionate. Okay, I can understand that. Mindfulness of breathing. Sure, that makes sense as well. Let's see where it takes us. Uh, yeah. Bliss and happiness. Okay, we have some idea that bliss and happiness is, uh, exists, yeah, because we all have some experience of these things. Uh, so this is the uh, kind of the amazing thing, the humble breath, uh, one of the most humble things in the universe, uh, something that we carry with us wherever we go. The moment you don't carry it with you, you're in serious trouble. So you carry it with you wherever you go. Uh, and they're always available. Wherever you are, you can sit down yeah, in the back seat of the car or on the bus, if you take, I don't know if you take the bus or when you're sitting here, whenever you have a few minutes extra, the breath is always with you, which means you can theoretically always meditate if you want to. Uh, and very, uh, and it's grounding. Sometimes by watching the breath, uh, all the kind of fancy things in the world that make you confused or make you, um, makes the mind agitated and restless. Uh, you may see a movie on TV and that may kind of carry you off into an alternative reality and you feel a bit spaced out after seeing that movie because you kind of enter that reality a little bit yourself. That's what movies are about, they're entering that reality. And yet the breath, the breath is what kind of brings you, uh, makes you earthbound again, yeah? It lets go of all those alien spaceships in the movie <laughs> and it brings you back to reality. The breath actually is very settling yeah? and very beautiful in this way makes the mind clear, lets go of delusion and all of these kind of crazy things that uh, makes us often so um, uh, lose a sense of contact with the reality, basically. Uh, so you can kind of already see just by contemplating what the breath is, uh, you can see why this may bring us towards awakening. Yeah, precisely because it is grounded, precisely because it clears the mind, uh, takes us away from illusion and delusion. Uh, so uh, very fruitful and beneficial. So how exactly is that the case? Well, mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. These are the four satipatthanas. So you will notice here, it fulfills the four satipatthanas. And this is a very, uh, very, very useful thing to be aware of. Uh, because uh, usually in meditation circles, uh, you will find that uh, mindfulness of breathing is considered only to be the first of the four, not all four. Yeah, when you read the Satipatthana Sutta, I don't know how often you read it, maybe not so often, but if you were to read the Satipatthana Sutta, it has four areas of Satipatthana, yeah? four areas of mindfulness. First one is the body, yeah? then you have the feelings, the Vedana, then you have the chitta, the mind, then you have Dhamma, which is like... Yeah, yeah, that's a kind of a controversial already what it means, but some people say mind objects, yeah, which is kind of okay. Yeah. So four areas of Satipatthana. And when you read that Satipatthana Sutta, mindfulness of breathing is only found in the first, uh, in the Kaya Nupassana, the contemplation of the body. It's only found in the first one. So people think, okay, mindfulness of breathing is like a preliminary thing. Yeah, it's like for the for the simple, simple people, they do that. I, you know, if you get more advanced, you go on to the feelings, etc. Yeah. So this is kind of how you create the hierarchy of Buddhists. You have the simple Buddhists and the more advanced Buddhists. So, so which Satipatthana are you doing, right? And um, but actually, the Buddha doesn't say that at all. Though. The Buddha says it is all mindfulness of breathing is the whole thing. Yeah? And when you look at the Satipatthana Sutta, it is not at all clear how you are going to do 
the contemplation of feeling or how you're going to do the contemplation of mind. It is not at all obvious. What is the context for that? And once you know the context is the breathing, it's very, very helpful. Everything is done via the breath. Yeah, it fulfills everything. Yeah. And uh, that gives us a different perspective on, um, on Satipatthana practice than what you, and that what is often taught or often heard. So this is a very useful way of thinking about it. Uh, everything is fulfilled. You don't have to do anything else. Uh, in fact, I would say you should only do this one uh, because this is said by the Buddha to be the way to fulfill it. So that's what we should follow. Uh, the Buddha doesn't say anything else is the way to fulfill it. This is the way to fulfill it. Uh, so this then should be the natural, the first port of call when it comes to um, meditation practice. Uh, so very useful. So what then? What happens then? So what happens then is that uh, you pull uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation when developed and cultivated fulfill the seven factors of awakening. Yeah. yeah? So when you do Satipatthana, what happens? You fulfill the seven factors of awakening. Yeah? And again, this is also very interesting. Yeah? Because the seven factors of awakening, well, what are they about? Well, they are about, first of all, mindfulness, yeah, which is basically the same as Satipatthana, the Sati Sambhojanga, the mindfulness awakening factor. Then it is the uh, uh, Dhammavichaya Sambhojanga, the awakening factor of contemplation of qualities, uh, or d- Dhammas. Uh, yeah? And that is also like a, a continuation of the mindfulness practice because you contemplate the dhammas, especially towards the end, dhamma nupassana, very similar to dhamma vichaya. Yeah? And then from that, you have then the uh, virya sambhojanga, yeah? the uh, awakening factor of energy, uh, piti sambhojanga, uh, the awakening factor of joy, uh, asaddi sambhojanga, the awakening factor of tranquility. Uh, this is all pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Uh, Energy, joy, tranquility. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. This. So what is this? Well, this is the consequence of mindfulness. In other words, it is just the consequence of meditation. This is what you can expect to happen in your meditation practice. Energy, piti, joy, and tranquility. These are some of the core ways that you know that your meditation is working because these qualities are arising in your mind. Yeah, gradually, 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 more and more profound. And then comes the samadhi sambhojanga, the awakening factor of, of stillness. Samadhi, right? So what that means is that the four mindfulness meditations, the, sati, the satipatthanas, they lead to samadhi, they lead to stillness. And then that samadhi, if you take it all the way to the very end, it, leads, it goes to upeka, the upeka sambhojanga, the awakening factor of upeka. And so what we have is that we have that satipatthana, the purpose of satipatthana is samadhi. It is jhana. That is what we want to do. That is kind of what we are heading for here. This is the purpose of it. And this is something you find throughout the suttas. That connection between sati and samadhi is always the same. From sati, samadhi arises. So it means that the purpose of satipatthana is to give rise to samadhi, give rise to jhana, to deep meditation. So we have mindfulness of breathing which then leads to samadhi. This is the main purpose. So what does that mean? Does that mean that that, uh, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, is just about tranquility, that there is no insight there? No, because both insight and tranquility lead to samadhi. Insight is also useful for samadhi, right? But what it means is just that we should aim for samadhi, first of all, and then the deep, really deep insights come later on. And on the pathway to samadhi, however, both vipassana and samatha will be useful. Yeah, this is why we've been talking about all these perceptions. All these perceptions are really a kind of vipassana. Yeah, we're trying to see the world in the right way. So samatha and vipassana are coming together. So satipatthana leading to samadhi, mindfulness leading to samadhi. This is kind of one of the critical things of the Buddhist path. And it's very interesting. And I think it is a very under-communicated part of the Buddhist path. That's why I am communicating it right now. So you can, (laughs) this is kind of (laughs) the purpose here. And uh, then, finally, the seven awakening factors, uh, when developed and cultivated, uh, they fulfill knowledge and vision. 
Vijja Vimutti. I mentioned this yesterday, and this is again something you see in a number of places in the suttas. It is through samadhi, yeah, through the awakening factors that you gain knowledge and vision, uh, and knowledge and freedom. Uh, this is exactly why the Noble Eightfold Path ends with the four jhanas, exactly the same reason, uh, because then you are basically in the presence of knowledge and vision. Uh, knowledge, vijja, freedom, vimutti. Uh, yeah, these are the two sides of what happens when you reach awakening. Uh, and uh, this is kind of good news, yeah? If you, you gain full vijja, you gain full insight into the nature of reality, and that full insight into the nature of reality brings with it freedom, freedom from the jail, yeah? Opening the doors uh, and uh, being free. That's kind of what it, what it means. So knowledge always brings with it good consequences. Uh, if you have the right knowledge or the right insight, good things will always happen from that, uh, so we should always seek more insight and understanding and knowledge on the path. Uh, and the consequences will always be positive because when you know something, when you know the truth, uh, then the mind will incline in the right direction. The mind will do the right thing automatically. Yeah. So you have good consequences. Uh. So this is what the Buddha promises. Uh. So coming to the breath, just doing the breath, breathing meditation. Yeah, And if you do this fully, uh, you will reach awakening as a consequence. Uh. That's kind of amazing, yeah. So um, the interesting question then is, uh, right, all of you have been trying to do mindfulness of breathing, uh, and uh, how many are awakened? <laughs> this is the thing. This is always the same, right? We are, it's, it is uh, the theory. It kind of seems so simple. Uh, but when we try to do it, you realize, actually, it is not as simple as the theory makes it out. Uh, and so our job is to uncover why it isn't so simple. Why doesn't it happen? Uh, when the Buddha says it is so straightforward, uh, right? Uh, and uh, so this is kind of what we need to uncover. Uh, and this is a very important part of what we will be dealing with as we go through the Anapanasati Sutta. So before we go to get into those details, uh, let's do some meditation together here. Uh, let's do some Anapanasati together here. Uh. <laughs> Ajahn, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, just now you mentioned fulfill knowledge and freedom. The Pali word for knowledge is one. Freedom is vimuti. Yeah, knowledge is vijja. Vijja. It's like the, you know the te vijja, the te vijja, the three knowledges at the end of the path, the knowledge of uh, past recollection of past lives, of kamma, and of uh, uh, of dis destruction of the taints or, or the arahantship. Vijja, vijja. Vijja. Yeah. So this will be after the, the, the noble eightfold path. Yeah. So this is, will be the, these are the consequences of practicing the noble eightfold path. Uh, yeah. This comes as a consequence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the vijja yeah. is is actually a very it's an interesting word. The word vijja it does mean knowledge in a certain way, but uh, on the Buddhist path it is probably more like uh, I mean there's a degree of knowledge to it, but it's also Insight is often a better word. I mean, if you see that there is a rebirth, yeah, that is part of that is a knowledge, a knowledge you may not have befo be beforehand, but it's also an insight into the nature of reality. So, wow, this is what it's like. This is amazing. Beforehand, the theoretical knowledge is not the same. And the same with, and especially when it comes to arahantship, because arahantship is an overturning of a you know, profound delusion of a self and all of these kind of things. Uh, then I think the idea of insight is a much more descriptive of what happens than, than knowledge. Uh, knowledge is what you get at university. Okay, it's nice, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not quite the same. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, Ajahn, I'm not sure whether I, I heard you correctly. You mentioned about the knowledge as three, three part of it, and the purpose yeah. is uh, past life, karma, or destructions. You, you, you think, or I didn't get you on the second and third. Okay, so the, so the, sec, the, the uh, first knowledge is the uh, recollection of past lives. Second one is the uh, understanding, the arising and passing away of beings, which basically is kamma. Yeah, it's about how beings arise and pass away. And the large one is the uh, ending of the um, corruptions of the mind, uh, uh, which is equivalent to arahantship. Uh, yeah? So the last one you can say is the attainment of arahantship, if you like. Yeah? Ending of the corruptions, the insight into the Four Noble Truths, uh, and the... In the, yeah, that's the last one. These are the three here. Uh, Tevija, three insights. So. Thank you. Okay. Hmm. 
Okay, maybe we can just get started. Uh, 